thank you so much um, for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I couldn't say no to Nikki. Um, she was a tremendous partner in a lot of the policy work that I uh, worked on in New Jersey and, and, and taught me policy uh, and health policy. Uh, so I'm a family doctor. I've been a frontline provider in the poorest city in America, in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, it's also the most dangerous city in America. But it turns out to be an incredibly good place to figure out how to deliver better care at lower cost because no one's fighting over more market share of Camden City residents, which is sort of a sad statement to make about the state of healthcare in America and how uh, market-driven healthcare is in many ways. Um, I've, it's been a pleasure to meet many leaders in Howard County, and, and I've had a chance to go around the country and meet leaders in communities like yours all over the country. And, and I can say that the only thing standing in the way of Howard County being the most innovative, interesting, uh, place, the healthiest community with the most longevity, um, is your ability to come together with a shared vision and execute and implement that vision. And uh, you want to be a place that young people want to stay, that they want to move to, that companies want to move to. And, uh, and healthcare is a big component of that, and it's a very challenging component to change, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we've had a terrible argument in our country for the last three years about whether we're going to cover everyone. And it's been a polarizing argument and really an ugly political argument. Um, it's more or less settled. We're going to cover everyone. And, and in Maryland and in Howard County, you're going to cover everyone. And the next question we're going to have to answer as a community and as a country is, what kind of coverage does that mean? When you get a card, what kind of care do you get? And ultimately, what does good care look like? And that's a much harder question to settle. Um, because you all have probably very different visions about what good care looks like. And good care is very hard to deliver in America because all the incentives point in the wrong direction and in the end often drive us to do the wrong things. So what we'll talk about today is, you know, my, my belief at this point is this is not a problem of bad doctors, bad hospitals, bad insurance companies, bad public officials. It's really a failure in our system and a failure of our own imagination as a public to stand up and take control of our system. We make the rules. We make them through state law. We make them through federal law. And we can change how the system operates. Um, and I think many of us are suffering individually when our family members get sick. But at some point, we're going to have to stand up as communities and say, I've had enough that good doctors, good hospitals, Good executives and insurance companies and nursing homes deliver care every day, but somehow the whole thing is disorganized. It's fragmented, and we're going to have to change that. So um, my journey in Camden began about uh, 15 years ago when I moved there as a young person, and I saw kids, adults, and delivered babies in a, in a, working in a very small office, a three-exam room office, in uh, the middle of a very poor community. And I also lived there for about eight years as well. And at that time, the city government was in takeover, school district is in takeover, the police department is in takeover. And every day as I saw patients, it's like a focus group of everything failing in healthcare. And when there's a failure, it rolls downhill and ends up in my office. So it gave me a lot of time to think about what was broken in, in healthcare. And my leverage point was really a, a medical student summer project where we managed to get a hold of billing data from every local hospital, from all three local hospitals. And this is their business intelligence. This is their customer data. Imagine for the business people in the room giving over your customer list and all your customer data. It's, it's a very challenging data set to get a hold of. And people like me never get a hold of data like this. Because I'm at the community level and I'm working with patients every day, I'm able to ask interesting questions about a data set like this that you might not be able to otherwise. This data set is now 10 years of data. It's got the name, address, date of birth, date of admission, all the cost data, the insurance data for every Camden resident. And because it's such a poor city, people don't come and go. It's a fairly contained place. It's nine square miles, 79,000 people. It's two hospitals, three emergency rooms, and about 15 primary care offices. And the data set really tells a, a terrible story about disorganized healthcare. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you through that data set because I have your data. And I've had an absolutely remarkable time looking at Howard County's data. And your data tells some really powerful stories as well. So let me take you through our, our story first. 
Our data set showed that half the population uses an emergency room or hospital in one year in Camden. We learned that someone went 324 times to the local emergency rooms and hospitals in a five-year period. Someone went 113 times in one year. The leading utilizer that we found in the country went 450 times in one year. It's a patient living in the city of Trenton, and we have a sister organization up there doing very similar work that worked with this patient. And in fact, the entire community, all of the agencies got together and worked on this one patient. And in the course of about uh, 12 weeks, they managed to get the patient uh, into housing and into a very different setting, uh, into a real collaborative care network. And they were able to get the utilization in the following year down to 18 visits. So what that story told me is a couple of things. One is that um, it's really hard to do this work because all of the rules that we make in our public systems don't work for outliers. And that's going to be a repeating theme in all of this, is that you know, we have highly structured systems with lots of rules. And we're going to have to break the rules and make new rules, because these rules don't work for outlier patients. In that case, it was a woman who was in her 50s, was homeless, and went more than once a day to the local emergency rooms. And she was very disruptive. Everyone in the city knew who she was. All of the emergency room docs knew her as well. She was a chronic inebriate, chronic alcoholic. And um, it turned out that as the team got to know her, that she had had horrible physical abuse and sexual abuse early in life and was really stuck at this point in her life. And as they offered her a housing unit, she would keep sabotaging. So one of the themes about these patients is that it's very hard to change their equilibrium. It's very hard to change where they are right now. And eventually, the head of one of the hospitals got involved, an entire community coalition of heads of agencies got involved and said, we're going to fix this one case. Because if we can fix it for the most difficult patient in our community, we can fix it for everyone. And it was very galvanizing. Because when you get together in community agency meetings, you can meet and meet and meet and meet and have these stakeholder meetings and, uh, and never get anywhere. But when you actually talk about one person, you can get very galvanized around that. The trick for this patient ended up being one of the hospital CEOs said, you can keep her in the hospital as long as you need to until she's ready to go to that housing unit. And they had a unit that's a housing first unit. So one of the problems in addiction is that we use a stick to addicts, and we whack them every time they relapse. And when you do that, they relapse more often. And if you make housing a carrot and stick and throw them out of their housing every time they relapse, every addict relapses. You're going to just stress them out. So in a model they're using up in New York, they put addicts right into housing. And it turns out that if you watch them over time, they go down in their utilization. And they get better and better over time. That it's a cycle of relapse and then improvement, and relapse and improvement over time. So the data is wonderful for it. And they put her into a housing first unit. And that was the key, really, to getting her utilization down and having a team, much like Gabriella's team, going out and, and working with her. So this is, it's possible to do this work. It's it possible to address outliers in data, but it requires brand new ways of thinking about things. It requires innovation in our public systems, and it's a community problem. So you know, when I say that everyone who you know, needs to be here to fix this problem, there are a lot of leaders of Howard County here uh, who can galvanize these efforts. The total amount of public money, because this is mostly Medicare and Medicaid, these are your tax dollars, is now up to $108 million a year for a city of 79,000 people to repeatedly hospitalize and put people in the emergency room. So that doesn't count all the other costs, the medications, the outpatient costs, radiology. That's just to repeatedly hospitalize people. The most expensive single patient was a Medicare patient, $3.5 million in payments for that one patient. 30% of the cost in our whole community of Camden are 1% of the patients. 80% of the costs go to 13% of the patients. And 90% of the costs to 20% of the patients. That basic rule is true in every bucket of healthcare spending that you look at, that a small percentage of the patients drive much of the utilization, much of the cost. By and large, we ignore those patients in healthcare unless we can cut, scan, zap, and hospitalize them. And that's really the deepest and most profound problem in the whole system, is that we have not built a system to pay attention to sick people. Unless you can do a service delivery to them, 
and drive revenue. And, and that's a really deep and profound problem as we begin to think about reshaping payment systems and reshaping delivery systems. It turns out that basic rule is true in every human system. If you're a teacher, there's two kids in the classroom that are always driving you crazy. If you're a principal, there's four or five families that are in your office all the time. If you're a, um, a police officer, there are a couple of people in your community that are driving much of the crime rates. And all of these systems do a terrible job of dealing with variability. We don't do a good job of pivoting our service delivery models to meet the needs of specific patients. We meet the needs of the average patient, but if you become an outlier, the whole system begins to fall apart. And this is not just a story of poverty, this is an experience that almost all of you have had at some point. So if you're blind, if you're deaf, if you're in a wheelchair, if you're overwhelmed, if you don't have a car, you don't have family member living here as you get older, if you've got many different illnesses, the whole system starts to break down. You get overwhelmed. And the moment that you realize it is when you're lying in a hospital bed or you're sitting next to someone lying in a hospital bed and 10 different doctors come in and out of the room to do consultations and you start to realize that none of the doctors are talking to one another, that you as the family member, the patient, know more about what's going on than any of the patients. We're paying a lot of money for that. It turns out that every one of those doctors can individually bill and individually drop a bill to Medicare for that service. They're not paid to talk to one another. So that's a deep misalignment in how we're paying for care and what we're doing. These are the top emergency room diagnoses in Camden. There were 12,000 visits for head colds, seven for ear infection, seven for viral infection, six for sore throat, five for asthma, five for stomach virus. So I wanna thank you as members of the public, as taxpayers, for paying for this. Because this is mostly insured patients. It's a myth in America that uninsured patients are the drivers of emergency room utilization. They're a part of it, but the vast majority of people sitting in the ERs in America have cards. And a Medicaid card in America is an empty promise. We have very broken delivery systems, frankly, for all of us. How many of you have had the problem of calling for an acute appointment at a primary care office? You get put on hold, you eventually get through, you've got to argue with the front desk staff, no, 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 I, I really am sick. You leave a message, no one calls you back for hours. You eventually get there, the, over, the waiting room is overflowing. You sit in the exam room and the doctor then runs for the door handle in 10 minutes. That's a broken system. We pay twice as much as every other country in the world for our healthcare. We pay twice as much as every other country in the world for our healthcare. People aren't dying in the streets in Canada. They're not dying in the streets in France. You know, we make the rules. We can decide that we want a different kind of healthcare system. The sad part about what I do as a primary care doc is that all the special sauce of being a primary care doc is essentially all unpaid work. If you get a call from your primary care doc at 5.30, 6 o'clock about your abnormal test result, about your abnormal mammogram, that's unpaid work. That is ad hoc unpaid work. If that doc spends an extra five or 10 minutes trying to explain something in the room, that is unpaid ad hoc work and they're backing up everyone in the, in the waiting room and in the other rooms. If you um, have a, a doc pick up the phone and start coordinating the care of all your specialists or do a family meeting and have a really hard end of life discussion, that's all unpaid work. So, you know, we can change that if we don't like that. So, you know, you can't expect a healthcare delivery system to ad hoc all the best stuff that we do. You know, we can change how we, how we structure this delivery system. So I can tell you how much you're paying for all of that. That's $150, $200, $300, $500 for a lot of those visits. And a small primary care office like mine, I was getting $19 to $35 a visit. And my office is currently boarded up as our primary care office is all over Camden. At the same time, we've tripled the size of our emergency rooms, we built new wings on all the hospitals, and we've hired lots and lots of specialists. And that's what's going on all over America. When you pick up the newspaper every day, it's a new ribbon cutting for a new wing or a new machine, you paid for that. Did you decide that you wanted to pay for that? Because you did pay for it. So when your copay goes up, when your deductible goes up, when your benefits go down, when your employer switches to a new plan, you, you paid for all that stuff. That's why your costs keep going up and up and up. So we're gonna to have to start having much harder discussions in America about we, where we spend our money. 
You know, we had a bridge fall down in Washington State recently. We have roads in disrepair. We have schools falling apart. We're laying off teachers. It's a fixed pie. We're in age of austerity. And we may recover from this, but the economy is never going to grow like it grew in the last 10 to 15 years, probably in our lifetime. So we're going to have to start making much, much harder decisions about where we allocate our resources. And right now, health care is cannibalizing our economy. 18% of our economy goes to health care. If we do nothing, it will go to 25% of the economy. 10,000 people turn 65 every day. We have 85 million baby boomers headed to the most expensive delivery system in the world. So we've got some really hard decisions. And these are not about rationing. How many of you in this room have personally experienced health care rationing? Just put your hand up. How many of you have had your copay go up? Have had your deductible go up? Have had your formulary change? Have had the restrictions in your plan change? That's called health care rationing. It's the slow, inexorable, invisible pace of health care rationing. And in the next 10 years, 15, 20 years, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. The reason the middle class have not gotten a raise in America is because all the money that would have gone into their raise went into their health benefits. So we, we've got some really tough discussions to have. Um, one of the most powerful segmentations of this data set has been by geography. And this is a map of the city of Camden with the home address of everyone's hospital bill layered out on top of one another over a five and a half year period. This is only nine square miles. This is a very small community. The red areas on the map are very small geographies. 6% of the city blocks are 10% of the geography, the area landmass, 18% of the patients, 27% of the visits to the emergency room and hospital, and 37% of the cost. It turns out that in America, complex, high cost patients get collected up into buildings together. And the question we all need to ask is, do we want to move those people around? Moving sick people in wheelchairs around is a waste of time and money. We need to bring health care to them. The two hotspots in Camden that are geographic cost and utilization hotspots are Northgate 2, which is a building full of dual eligibles. These are poor, disabled, older patients. Uh, 600 patients living in the building had 12 million in payments for their care over five and a half years. And 300 patients in the Abigail House, which is a nursing home and subacute rehab, had 15 million in receipts for payment for their care. Now, I can tell you that these buildings are beautiful buildings. They have phenomenal management who cares really deeply about the people living in the building. This is not a story of a scary poverty building. It's not a story of management not managing these buildings well. This is not a story of bad doctors or bad hospitals. This is a story of a broken system and a system that we pay a lot of money for. So this is publicly funded for the most part, what we're talking about. So you know, once again, we can change this if we want to change it. We've been very deep in both of these buildings beginning to learn some of the dynamics. And let me give you an example of uh, someone living up in Northgate 2. We were getting calls um, uh, and a referral about a patient in the 70s. And our teams went out to visit the patient in the house, much like Gabriella was describing. And we went out to meet the patient. And he's a diabetic, frequently going back to the emergency rooms for high sugars. And uh, we went to his house. And our teams asked to see him use his insulin. And he set the insulin bottle down. And he put a syringe in the bottle and went to drop 50 cc's of air and inject it into his arm. And our team was just horrified. And even now when I tell you the story, I'm sort of horrified because I think back to all the patients in my office who were poorly controlled diabetics. And we have this really awful word for them. We call them non-compliant. It's, it's as if we know why their sugars are high. And we immediately jump in medicine to this idea that they must not be complying, that they must not be ad adhering to their diet or doing what we tell them to. And it turned out that um, he went to the refrigerator and he pulled out two bags of little insulin bottles. And the pharmacy had kept bring his, bringing his insulin. And he said, I, I use my insulin every day, but I can't seem to empty the bottles. So he'd been doing this for a long time. It turned out that he was sight impaired. And he couldn't see the, what he was doing. You know, and there are so many failures in healthcare. And you don't know about the failures until you get into the details. You've got to get into people's homes and begin to figure this out. So um, 
and we've had lots of stories in Abigail House as well. And you know, the tragedy in our, our, our nursing homes and subacute rehabs is that it's not like it's a mystery in Howard County where older patients live. And, um, and in the current structure of how we build nursing homes, uh, there is no one above a nurse there at night. So that if there's a problem with a patient, there's often no one in the building to be able to, uh, to check on them. So they get transported to the emergency room. And once an older person gets to an emergency room, you can always find something wrong. They are guaranteed to end up in a bed. <laughs> and once they end up in a bed, boy, it's like, it's like taking your car to a, 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 an auto shop and like suddenly you find out like 15 things are wrong. You're like, gee, it was running last week. <laughs> you know, you put an older person in a scanner and what aren't you gonna find wrong, <laughs> right? You know, talk about cross-marketing opportunity. Like gastroenterology, dermatology, you got a mole, dermatology, we gotta bring neurology, we gotta bring cardiology to the bedside, you know, and they can all drop a bill. I mean, that's amazing. You know, once we transport these folks, they just get gobbled up by the hospital system. So we've got to do a much better job of keeping them where they are and bringing care to them. Um, we've mapped out, we've got a sister organization in Trenton and Newark, we've mapped out their data, and everywhere we go, we keep finding buildings, and buildings full of sick people. And uh, we need to do a lot better job. We need to think about the geography and how the geography can he be helpful. This is not the only useful segmentation. There are many ways, and I'm gonna show you how we look at your data. Uh, this is, we mapped three counties in Maine and found out that even in a rural state, as you get older and more disabled, you get collected into buildings. And we ended up rank, this, pub, uh, this report was publicly released, and we rank ordered all the towns by the percentage of high utilizers they have in their town. Because what I wanted to say to those towns is, don't you care about your most vulnerable residents? Why is your town twice as likely to have someone over utilizing the hospital as this town over here. You know, this is a community problem. This is about your churches. This is about your nonprofits. This is about your community leaders taking care of your most vulnerable citizens. And they're not just poor. Some of them are middle class and upper class. You know, as you get older, you know, you start to um, drift into the system a lot. So let me talk about another case. This is a 55-year-old male admitted for a stomach bleed and shortness of breath. This is a dual eligible patient, has Medicare and Medicaid, living in a high rise, in six months had nine emergency room visits and six inpatient visits. That is a total failure. You know, I mean, if nothing else, you should galvanize yourself as a community that a hospitalization is a failure till proven otherwise. It's a good rule of thumb to begin thinking about this and challenge yourself to see how amazing of a healthcare system could you build here in Howard County that people wouldn't need the hospital. Now that's gonna turn some of your economic drivers on their head and you're gonna to need to think really hard about where your job engines are and where your economic drivers are. So this patient is on 12 meds a day, has end stage renal disease, kidney cancer, hepatitis B, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, blockages in his arteries to his legs, asthma, glaucoma, sleep apnea, and severe back pain. And this is a visualization of this patient. The patient's in the middle, and um, our teams picked him up in hospital number one, followed him out to subacute rehab. He got readmitted within a day to hospital number two. Hospital number two had no idea what hospital number one had done, despite the fact that you all paid $10,000 to hospital number one, the residents don't do the dictation summary till the end of the month. And they write a sort of chicken scratch, you know, dictation discharge summary. Um, so if we hadn't been following the patient, you know, they would have had to repeat all the tests. We needed to coordinate home nursing, home PT and OT, transport meals, durable medical goods, dialysis, nephrology, transplant. The poor primary care provider paid maybe 50 bucks, had a 10 minute, 15 minute visit, somehow needed to coordinate ophthalmology, pain management, GI, cardiology, urology, oncology, and surgery. So that in one slide is the entire long-term federal debt. The long-term federal debt in America, the bulk of it, is healthcare. It's not Social Security, it's not defense, it's not the post office, it's healthcare. So um, we gotta figure this out, we gotta figure it out soon. We don't have a debt crisis in America, we've got a Medicare spending crisis in America and a Medicaid spending crisis. So um, the problem right now is that none of those circles, the doctors, 
have ever been trained to play nice, work in teams and talk to one another. We don't move the data around. Everyone locks up their data. And, um, and we don't have the teams or the workforce to even begin doing this. And we don't have the payment models to support it. What a hard public problem, right? You don't have the people to do it, you don't have the data to do it, and you don't have the payment models to do it. You know, there's a special place in heaven if you, if you do the right thing in this, but you'll go out of business if you do the right thing. So these are the crazy piles of medications that you find in people's homes. We have a, a bag of medication that's worth $50,000 that's not been taken, not been used, because of all the hospitals starting and stopping uh, different meds on a patient. This is the patient in the middle. His primary care provider is on the left. In the middle is an AmeriCorps volunteer. She's a young woman named Corinne who graduated from college and spent a year with us as a health coach out in the community. And on the right is Jason Torrey, who's a nurse. And Corinne spent an enormous amount of time working with his patient. And the special sauce of this work is delegation, delegation, delegation to non-licensed professionals who can do a lot of the work. A lot of this is coordination work. And we've got to save the talent of our social workers and of our nurses and give them people to delegate to so that we can leverage their time and their energy. This is the kind of data that we use for our intervention. And this is unbelievably hard to gather. And you are in an amazing state because you have a phenomenal health information exchange that can give you this data every day. So this is a list that we print out. And the Camden Coalition, my nonprofit, runs a health information exchange in Camden where we get real-time labs, radiology results, hospital discharge summaries, and demographics streaming in. We pull all that data, we dump the raw data out into Microsoft Access, and we make a report like this every day. And this is a citywide hospital census of everyone who's been admitted to the local hospitals, and we use this for targeting our patients. So we pick people who've had two inpatient visits in the last six months, we go to the bedside, we go to their house within 24 hours, we go with them to their primary care appointment, and with them to their specialty appointments. So it's messy, hard, granular work, much as you just heard in the discussions that, um, and the cases Gabrielle gave you, Gabriella. So um, we have a really tough moment in healthcare right now. We've got a blockbuster video moment. And there had to been a moment when the um, executives at Blockbuster Video had a young person come to them and say, there's this crazy new service. People are renting videos online. And the Blockbuster Video leadership said something like this. We have data that shows every Friday night, Americans all over the country spend an hour and 15 minutes in our stores picking a video. Why would anyone do that if they don't like it? So many of you spent hours and hours and hours and hours every Friday. So, and what came along is they got disrupted. This is disruptive innovation. And they got disrupted by a new idea of how to, uh, how to get videos. Uh, this is the story of America's disruption. And the hospital industry is gonna get disrupted if they don't figure out the story of disruptive innovation. And the disruption is gonna be good health. It's gonna be good care coordination. And let me show you what that's gonna look like. So I have a really big announcement today. You're, you can say you heard it here. The Fountain of Youth is not in Florida. The Fountain of Youth has been discovered in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. And it is a net-enabled, nanotechnology, high-tech nurse. It's just a really great nurse trained in an intervention to go out every week or every other week to visit a very frail, elderly, middle-class person living around Doylestown, Pennsylvania in a very high fidelity inter intervention. And this is one of the largest studies that will ever be done in population health. 1,700 patients in a randomized controlled trial. And what they found is that uh, they had a 25% reduction in the death rate of patients that were enrolled in the intervention. Now what that really means, if a nurse is enough to lower your death rate by 25%, what that really says is that our current delivery system in America has an excess mortality for the elderly of 25% because we're so disorganized. And what's even scarier is that the highest risk patients had a 48% reduction in the death rate. So those were frail elderly 80-year-olds living at home 
having a nurse visit every week or every other week who have three comorbidities. To, go, to get those kind of numbers, you have to go back to the polio era. You've got to go back to the age of like introducing antibiotics. Blood pressure treatment, cholesterol treatment, aspirin, doesn't even come close to those numbers. That's just a highly trained nurse coming out to your house you know, once a week or every other week to your mom or your grandmother could make that much of a difference. What's even more amazing is for the high-risk cohort, they had a 33% reduction in hospitalization and a 22% reduction in total cost of Medicare. That would put your hospital out of business. That would put every hospital in America out of business. We have a huge public policy problem. If you want that for your mom, if you want that for your grandmother, we're going to have to move all the pie around. We're going to have to change how we talk about healthcare, how we think about healthcare. So your state is pursuing an innovation grant, and they've hired Ken Coburn, the lead author and the person who designed this, to come down and be an advisor to think about how you would scale this work in, uh, in Maryland. You don't need to wait for them to tap you on the shoulder. Like, don't wait for the feds to rescue you. Don't wait for the state to rescue you. Like, you and Howard County can solve these problems yourselves. So let me show you your data. Um, we had so much fun uh, looking at your data. And the good news is that um, you were not as bad as Camden. <laughs> So obviously you guys have a, overall a pretty healthy county, but you do have outliers. You can always do something better, right? Um, so our method is really a classic business method. If you want to fix your business, you look at outliers, you look at variability. So this is not a new idea. In fact, everything I'm doing, there are people in this room that were doing this same work 30 years ago. You know, unfortunately, every good idea just keeps coming back till hopefully it finally sticks. So you know, the idea that costs are driven by high cost patients you know, shouldn't be the re revelation. The fact that we ignore sick people, you know, people have known that for a long time. Um, so, so let me show you your data. Uh, we, your Howard County General Hospital was kind enough to share raw billing data, and we cleaned it up, and we're using a tool that's called Tableau. And Tableau is like Excel on steroids, but anyone can use it. I could sit this in front of any of you, and you could ask questions of the data. So what we're hoping to do is turn this back over to someone here, uh, at the foundation, at the hospital, or both, so that you've got local data resources. We believe deeply that data has got to be right next to the people building the interventions. If the data is like locked away at the state, if the data is locked away at, um, far away, you can't innovate. This has got to be right next to all of you. So I'm gonna, there's a lot of this, and you're going to have to really sit and look at the paper report, and I think um, that'll be released. But I want to move quickly and pull out highlights so that we can have some time for questions. So your utilization review, 1% of your patients or 9% of your charges. That's the lowest that I've seen anywhere. So that's really an indication that compared to Camden and compared to America, you guys are taking care of people here. You have uh, a higher income community and you have a pretty well run system. 20% uh, of your patients are 50% of your charges. That's cost. Um, one of the things we're really intrigued by is segmentation. In healthcare, we don't do a good job of segmentation unless we're trying to sell you something. And the reason that Barack Obama won the election is that they segmented the marketplace of voters very discreetly. And if you got an email or you got a phone call, or if you didn't get an email or didn't get a phone call, it's because they understood deeply all the market segments. That's what we're going to need to do in healthcare. And I'm going to show you what segmentation is in your data. So up top, this is all of your data for a year of inpatient utilization and ED utilization. And uh, up top is breaking out inpatient visits, and on the left is breaking out ED visits. So the way you read this is that in one year, you had only three people have five or more ED visit, I'm sorry, five or more inpatient visits and seven or more ED visits. So your most extreme outliers, you only have three of them. You guys can fix that. For God's sakes, in, Cam in Camden, we've got like, I don't know, hundreds of them. Um, you know, over here you had eight people who never got admitted but kept going back to the ER seven or more times. So each of these market segments, each of these boxes, you need to understand the sociology, the psychology, the demographics, the disease profile, and then you can build workflows. The business people here, this is just a business problem. You need to build a workflow, a different workflow for each of the market segments. So 
Uh, so let's break out a market segment. This is for the entire utilization. There are 38,000 unique patients. Total charges, this is the bill sent by the hospital. This doesn't mean payments back, of $152 million. And this is the breakdown of insurance and age. So you have a, a very equal distribution of commercial insurance, Medicare and Medicaid, compared to Camden. And now let's look at one market segment. This is just looking at inpatient overutilizers. So over on the right here, these are everyone who had five or more inpatient visits in one year. It's only 100 people. You can fix that. It's $8 million in charges. It's 5% of total charges. And most of them are Medicare patients. 63 out of the 100 were Medicare patients. The other 20% are Medicaid. And most of them are over 75, 55 to 64. Um, you know, this is a fixable problem. You know, if I show you our data in Camden, the same data, I mean, it's a much bigger problem. Um, so this is walking across the segments. Let me show you uh, ER overutilizers. This is anyone who's been three or more times in one year to the emergency room, but never got admitted. So that's 1,700 patients, 5 million in charges. It's 4% of, of the patients that went to the hospital. And they are more Medicaid patients. And they also tend to be younger patients as well. So that's a different intervention. It's a different problem. And you can use this kind of data to build pilot projects and then measure the effectiveness of those pilots. So this is breaking down utilization for your emergency room in a two-year period, uh, 2011 and 2012. So about 43,000 visits in a year to the emergency room by 32,000 patients. It averages about 1.3 visits per patient per year. It's 39 million in charges. It's an average of $900 per visit. Um, and 8% of those visits appear to be avoidable. That's by current constructs. We think that a lot more of these are avoidable, but by our best data, uh, at minimum, 8% are avoidable. 5% um, have mental health and substance abuse as the primary reason they're there. 1% uh, are dental. The number 15% have an ED visit twice within 60 days. Um, and if you look at these repeat utilizers of the ER, um, people who are coming back within 60 days, they represent 10 million in total charges. Um, and uh, it's 27% of the total charges in the community. Um, this breaks down some of the diagnoses. These are top 10 primary diagnoses. Emergency room data has four fields for diagnoses, so this is the primary reason for going. So uh, the number one reason is uh, uh, people fainting, essentially, uh, 700 people. Uh, pneumonia, 600. Uh, sepsis, 600. Uh, those are likely a lot of elderly patients, so you start to think about flu vaccination, pneumovax vaccination, hand washing. Uh, it turns out that we've probably saved more elderly patients by their kids getting vaccinated. Prevnar, which is a vaccine um, that prevents uh, meningitis and ear infections, has done a lot to actually save their grandparents' lives because the kids aren't transmitting illness to the grandparents. Um, so these are the top 10 avoidable. Um, so you had 500 people who went for head colds. Uh, they had 596 visits and 359,000 in charges. Number two preventable was headaches, 500 people. Uh, ear infections, um, backache, uh, two kinds of backache, um, infection in the eye, uh, sinusitis, people just going for routine follow-up exams, uh, administrative exam, which I'm not quite sure what they're categorizing for that. Essentially, you've got a lot of opportunity to work down things that really don't need to be in the emergency room. And now you've got a way of measuring it. You can track this and see the impact you're having. Uh, these are the top 10 uh, these are for high utilizers. So these are the 600 highest utilizers, and they're coming back for asthma, head colds, depression, headache, uh, abdominal pain, chest pain. They come for a lot of pain disorders. Um, so emergency room high utilizers tend to be younger. They have a lot of early life trauma. They have addiction, pain disorders, and repeatedly coming back to the emergency room. Uh, these are the inpatient statistics over a two-year period. In 2012, you had 12,000 inpatient hospitalizations. 
by 9,000 patients. On average, it was 1.2 visits per patient in a one-year period. Uh, each year, it's uh, 112 million in charges. The average charge is about 9,000 a visit. 15% uh, of them have diabetes as one of their diagnoses. 30% have high blood pressure. 15% have COPD. And 13% of them come back again within 60 days. So your 60-day re readmission rate uh, is 13%. Uh, and of that category of people who are coming back, they represent $28 million in charges. So you know, there's a real opportunity there. Uh, the reasons they get admitted are pneumonia, uh, prenatal complications, depression, asthma, uh, OB trauma, respiratory failure, cellulitis, heart failure. Buried within in this is a lot of opportunity that requires tremendous amounts of granular work to pull apart. So, um, so there are two ways of, of breaking this data out into buckets. What I showed you was a very simple way called a crosstab, and it's a segmentation in a crosstab. There's a much more advanced math way of doing this called cluster analysis, where you essentially, you ask the data what naturally hangs together? What are their natural buckets by the data? It's a nonlinear data method. And we did what's called cluster analysis to your data and found out what are your natural buckets? Because as we've gone around the country and looked at different data sets, every community has a different fingerprint. And what is high utilization in one place is not high utilization in another place. So we categorized your patients into, these are like, mar any marketers in the room? These are like market segments. So one-timers, low ED utilizers, high ED utilizers, early stage high utilizers, high utilizers, and extreme highs. So we're kind of breaking this down into natural groups. So let's look at what each group is. In 2012, uh, one-timers are people who had one ED visit in a year and there were 30,000 people who had one emergency room visit. Um, the low ED utilizers had two emergency room visits and there are 6,000 of them. The high ED utilizers had four ER visits in a year. It's only 600 patients and it's four million in charges. Um, the early stage inpatient high utilizers had two inpatient visits in a year, one ED visit. It's 1,200 patients with 29 million in charges. The high inpatient utilizers are, had three inpatient visits, two ED visits. It's only 300 people, and you had 15 million in charges. And the extreme patients are, had six inpatient visits in a year. They had four ED visits, and uh, there are 61 of them with four million in charges. So, you know, if I said to some of the people in the room, I want to give you a grant to build a project, and I want you to target 60 people and you're operating on a baseline of 4.5 million in cost, you could build a project to, to do that. So that's how you begin to use this data. You can break down the cost, you can break down the demographics, you can break down the insurance profile. So it allows you to, to ask some very discrete questions. We've mapped out the entire data set for all your utilization. Uh, there's a few geographic hotspots across the entire data set. I don't know your geography, so in the middle and up top. Uh, what gets really interesting is if you break out the segments. So the high emergency department utilizers are very concentrated and they are in the middle of your county. So that may be a high poverty. They tend to be younger, generally speaking. Uh, the early stage high utilizers, these are inpatients beginning to go to the hospital. Uh, these tend to be older patients, are very clustered. They get down to the building level. The high utilizers, which are inpatient high utilizers. Um, so these are people who've had three inpatient visits, two emergency room visits. Uh, it's only 300 patients, are highly clustered into two very small geographies that get down to the building level. And your extreme high utilizers, only 60 patients. So let's take a deeper dive in this. These are, by and large, patients with Medicare and Medicaid. Um, they tend to be older patients between the 50s and 70s. Uh, they, they come in for sepsis, they come in for respiratory failure, heart failure, asthma, pneumonia, depression, renal failure. These are very, very sick people. They have real medical problems. So the story that I'm coming to tell you today is not to hospital, you know, it's totally reasonable to hospitalize people who need to be in the hospital. It's just we need to do a great job keeping them healthy and keeping them out. So. Um, and when we brought all of this down to the address level, 
it maps down to very specific addresses. And I want to be totally clear that this is just like our data. When we've gone to facilities, they are beautiful facilities often with great management that care a lot about the patients. This is not their fault. And you've got a great hospital. This is not your hospital's fault. This is all of our fault. This is a system failure. It's the failure of all of us to stand up as a community and say we've had enough. We want to change the rules in how the system works. You have the ability in Howard County to stand up, work with uh, Secretary Sharfstein, work with the policymakers. You have an incredible state. I want to pick Camden, New Jersey up and move it to Howard County. <laughs> Because you have really wonderful policymakers and leaders, so you know you have an you have an opportunity to do some very advanced things. And what you need to do is move to a global budget. The way we pay for healthcare in bits and pieces will never fix this. The way to fix this is to move to a global budget, and you have the opportunity to do that. So let me stop there, and and let's do some questions. Yeah. Uh, Kim Flowers, Howard County Government. I enjoyed your presentation. Very good. Thank you very much for um, coming today. Um, I have two questions. Um, you said that we all essentially do the right thing. And I guess hospitals, if we all do the right thing, hospitals will be out of business. Um, and I'm sure that, I don't know how much of that is that verbally. Or does it essentially mean hospitals have to got to kind of change their business business model and I guess be more accessible just for maybe elective procedures or surgeries and then and ER? And so that's a question. The second question is, what role do you see urgent care playing um, in all of this? Um, I guess reform. Sure. So hospitals' business model is the same as the hotel and the airline industry. It's all based on occupancy rates, and they have very, very high fixed cost. Turning the lights on every day and staffing that building is unbelievably expensive. And it turns out that half the service lines lose money. They make most of their margins just on a couple of things that are very highly paid, and you want to drive volume through them. So if you want to know what they are, just look at all the billboards. So they make more money on an orthopedic procedure on a cardiac procedure than they do on lots and lots of other stuff. So, and you build that capacity, that capacity is very expensive to build, and then you need to drive volume through it. And it turns out that in any business model that has high fixed cost, low variable cost, just like the auto industry, once your volume gets below a certain point, you go from making an incredible amount of money to losing an incredible amount of money. So if you drop their occupancy rates by a small amount, they can't just fire the nurses. They can't flex their capacity day by day to absorb those changes in demand. So they are locked into bonds. They're locked into leases. They're locked into a lot of high cost stuff. So we have a really big capacity problem in America. We have too much capacity. And we're going to have to buy it down, shift that capacity, and help to make an economic tran transition. Here's how bad the problem is. If you go to Philadelphia, my, my, where I live right now, and you want to know how many patients visited a cardiologist last year. Don't count up the number of heart failure patients. Don't count up the number of elderly. Count up the number of cardiologists. So they don't fly with empty exam rooms. If you want to know in New York City how many people were admitted to a hospital, don't count up the number of elderly, the number of sick. Count up the number of hospital beds. The most dangerous thing in America is an empty hospital bed. So we have the huge capacity problem. And if you don't get control of the capacity problem, then it'll get totally unregulated. So how many gamma knives do you need in this region? How many NICUs do you need? We stopped answering that question back in the 70s. We used to tightly regulate supply because the market doesn't work very well in healthcare. It's a very asymmetric market. So, yeah. I have a question uh, related to Kathy Westcott Health Praxis Maryland, re related to how your hot spotting work is funded. Um, and I ask because I have an organization in Baltimore City where we have a hot spotting program with um, with City Hall around frequent 911 callers. So yep. it's a model, mm -hmm. it's a model that works. Yep. We 
drove calls to 911 down yep. by 80%. Yep. Yeah, we went to hospitals to see if they would, nobody's interested. Yep. Hospitals aren't interested, yep. insurance companies aren't interested, nobody really seems to yep. want to make a change, so I'm just yep. curious. This is incredibly important, what you just heard. So this is a testimonial of a project that works, that saves you all money, the taxpayer, and it's going to die if the political leadership doesn't keep funding it. And you're paying twice as much as every other country in the world. So this is a really powerful public problem. We have got to stand up and get control of these systems. We've got runaway feedback loops here of our money going to put cranes up and build more and more buildings instead of helping sick people and taking better care of them. We are totally unstably funded. So, and Ken Coburn, the study I just showed you, so he just pulled the plug on his project. So Medicare, that was a Medicare chronic care demo that was started 10 years ago and funded by Medicare. And Medicare had him just send letters to his patients saying, you're being disenrolled from the project because we're ending this project. So I, I, you know, there are so many examples that Nikki can give you of absolutely worthwhile interventions. We've been doing this before. 30 years ago, we did a lot of this work. And it keeps going away because it doesn't make anyone money because we haven't moved the economic drivers around. So your governor knows this. Your secretaries know this. Your public officials are talking about it. But we've got to all talk about it. When you go to a ribbon cutting of a hospital, you've got to really think hard about why you're there, what you're cutting the ribbon for, and did you need that? And is your copay going to go up next year because those costs get distributed to all of us?